Tonight's author, Professor Jennifer Finney Boylan, is the author of 14 books, including, I believe to be the extraordinary, beautiful, courageous, hilarious, and deeply moving memoirs, She's Not There and Stuck in the Middle with You. Uh, seriously, after you buy tonight's event book, you need to go buy those two. Um, if not for yourself, then for that uh, person in your family who definitely needs to read it, or a friend. Okay, rent over. Additionally, Professor Boylan is the inaugural Anna Quinlan Writer in Residence at Barnard College in Columbia University. She also serves as the national co-chair of the board of directors of GLAAD. Jenny also served on the board of trustees of the Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction, and is special advisor to the president of Colby College in Maine. So, tonight's book. Genius singer-songwriter Harry Nilsson once sang, You can climb a mountain, you can swim a sea, you can jump into the fire, but you'll never be free. You can shake it up, or you can bring it down. Whoa, oh, oh. And for the characters in Boylan's latest novel, this is certainly true. One terrifying, unforgettable night in Eastern State Penitentiary, long before it became a tourist attraction, casts the long black veil of the title over the rest of their lives. As the characters sort out their second acts, many questions are asked. What can you do hide within you and still endure? Are you really crazy when saints and dogs talk back to you? Can you tell devastating lies in order to achieve the truth? Can you start over again? Can you ever really know someone? Jenny delivers a riveting story, but leaves the answers to you. Will you please join me in welcoming Professor Jennifer Finley Boyd. Stand right here. Do I have to speak yeah. into this thing? Hello, 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 Washington, D.C. Okay. Wow, this looks great. <laughs> have you seen this? It's incredible. <laughs> um, thank you, Pat. Um, and um, gee whiz, um, thank you to everybody who came out tonight. I know today is a big day in, uh, um, well, uh, for, for all of us who are trying to make a better future. Um, it's, it was a full day. Um, this is the third reading in the store of the day. I know many of you are coming from the Climate March. Um, some of you are going to leave early to get to the um, correspondence dinner. Whew. So I'm, I'm glad that you, that you could fit me in. Um, and uh, uh, I'm also, uh, I have a particular place in my heart um, uh, for this town where uh, my wife is um, from and where we spent our days courting uh, in this town. And in fact, where we were married 29 years ago uh, this summer. So we have now been married for, it will be um, 29 years, 17, well no, 12 as, as husband and wife and 17 as wife and wife. And um, speaking of Didi, there she is. There's my wife. <laughs> Um, so I think of Washington as a very romantic town. You probably don't if you live here. <laughs> but I, I have a, the um, affection for this town that um, maybe only an out-of-towner can have. But uh, um, So uh, uh, I'm grateful to all of you. Um, and I'm also grateful to uh, Mary Beth Busby, who is um, uh, looking out for us today, just as she looked out for us when she hosted our wedding uh, 29 years ago, um, or our, our wedding reception, which was at the National Cathedral. Um, not, I mean, not the Great Crossing. It was in the, the chapel in the back, but still, you know. Um, and I remember riding up, was it, was it Wisconsin? Wait, where did he go? Massachusetts. Massachusetts Avenue, from the cathedral to DuPont Circle um, in a horse-drawn carriage. Um, and I remember we were so in love, and there was champagne, and that we were, you know, going going up in our horse-drawn carriage, you know, blocking all the traffic on uh, on Massachusetts Avenue. And I remember that there was this a single woman behind us who like passed us, and she looked at us, you know, in our you know our wedding regalia, and she just I'll never she just went, oh, what a couple of assholes, and <laughs> 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 kind of drove past. So anyway. Um, so it's lovely to be back in, in, uh, in D.C. Um, and uh, so um, here's the new book, Long Black Veil. And it's my first book of fiction uh, after three memoirs. 
uh, my first work of, um, it's my first novel for grown-ups in almost 20 years. So this book begins at a place called Eastern State Penitentiary where um, six friends from college on a hot night in um, 1980 uh, are goofing around. Um, so Eastern State is a real place. It's right there in the, in the heart of Philadelphia. It's like a stone's throw from the art museum. And uh, it's the country's oldest penitentiary. It was designed by Benjamin Franklin. Um, so before the revolution and stayed open until 1972. So um, when I was growing up, it was just this big ruin in the center of Philly. They couldn't figure out what to do with it. And it's a whole, it's a giant city block. It was built to look like a medieval fortress. It's supposed to look like a place you never want to get stuck in. It's got these high walls. It's got like medieval turret corners uh, with um, arrow slit windows. Um, it's a most fearsome looking place. And um, uh, it, um, it now uh, rents itself out um, two months of the year uh, as something called terror behind the walls. Um, which is uh, billed as the world's largest haunted house behind the walls of a real prison. Um, but the rest of the year, it's now a kind of combined archaeological site and um, uh, museum. So anyway, I went there uh, a few years ago, four or five, six years ago, with a friend and took the tour, and it just struck me as the creepiest place I'd ever been. Um, and uh, most of it is still kind of in ruins. They can't they're, they're trying to keep it from falling over. Um, anyway, so the first thing I thought was, well, this would be the perfect place to begin a scary novel. Um, and so, in fact, that's what happens. Here are, here are um, six friends from college walking around, uh, goofing around. They break in to, to this place and um, fairly quickly manage to get themselves locked in and then just as quickly, once they're locked in, find that behind those walls, they are not alone. <laughs> so that's chapter one. Um, so um, something bad happens. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, uh, the difference between memoir and a novel of suspense is like the memoir, you kind of know how it turns out. Like, I'm still alive. <laughs> But a novel of suspense, I, I'm being, trying, to, trying not to give away too much, although I think I have to give away some things to, even, to, to have any sort of conversation about this. Anyway, something bad happens, and uh, the, the, most of the novel takes place in the present, where the um, uh, six friends from college are now uh, in their 40s and 50s and uh, are still dealing with the consequences of that night. And, um, uh, and yeah, okay, the consequences of that night. So, what I thought th all those years ago when I first went to that prison was not only what a cool place to, to, to set a novel of suspense, but also I was thinking about the prisons people build for themselves. Um, uh, and the cruelest ones and the most common ones are all psychological. Most of these characters arrive in their middle age, having never quite become the people that they were meant to be. Uh, you might not be shocked to learn that one of the characters might turn out to be transgender. Maybe. <laughs> Let's just consider this possibility for a moment. Um, uh, and in fact, she has lived most of her life in what my people used to call stealth. And stealth was what they used to tell trans people how to um, make your passage. In other words, you go, you, uh, you take care of the business, uh, and then you change your name, and then you move someplace where nobody knows you, and you start life over again, and you don't tell anyone about your past. And that used to be, really until like 10, 15 years ago, the standard um, prognosis for trans people. You go, have your surgery, move somewhere, and then just tell everyone, uh, and, and never tell anybody that you're trans. And you should be cut off from your family, um, from everyone that you've ever known. Uh, and so in a real crazy way, these are people who have been cut off from their past and from the kind of natural support network that keeps people sane. But that used to be the way that they would 
I guess, I guess the idea of being trans, like openly trans, was so terrible that, you know, that was, it was seen better, better to go through that than to have people, you know, think of you as in some otherized way. But um, this character is not the only person in the book who winds up um, uh, having to make peace with their former self. All the characters are trying to um, live up to the idea of the person that they hoped they could be when they were young. Anyway, um, I think the book, at least the, the, the questions that uh, haunted me as I was writing the book and which haunt me in the rest of my life are the questions of what's the connection between the people we become and the people that we've been? I mean, if you're, if you're my age, which is 58 now, um, I'm, a, I'm a woman who never had a girlhood. So what does it mean to be a middle-aged woman who had a boyhood? And, you know, there are times when, um, you know, boyhood was not all bad, I hate to say. Um, uh, and so how do I draw a line between who I am now and who I was? And yet, I don't think this is a particularly unique um, dilemma for transgender people. I think all of us have a before and an after in our lives. Whether you're trans or we're, no matter who you are, there is something that's, that marks uh, a line in our lives that you cross. And some of us have several of them. So the question is, how do we connect who we become to who we've been? Um, there's an old um, saying about the old New England farmer who has uh, the, he says he's got the world's greatest shovel because it'll last forever. I've replaced the blade three times and the handle twice. <laughs> That's how good it is. It lasts that long. But we're all like that shovel, right? We, each of us um, changes over the course of years. Um, whatever the equivalent of replacing your shovel or replacing your handle, um, whatever experience you have. Um, we are, if you live a long life, um, I mean, you hear transgender people and other people say this as well. I'm still the same person. And yet, where is that child? Where is that boy? Where is that person that you were? What is it, what is it that makes us the same shovel? So we could have a long conversation about that. But the thing, to me, the way you answer that question is, what, what is the continuity of identity? It's soul. It is our souls that remain the same uh, over time. So these are some of the ideas in this book. I guess the, 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 the final one is, in any life that contains a before and an after, how is it possible to live one life rather than two? I'm going to read you two short pieces, I think, depending on how restless you get to be. Um, uh, you've, maybe I'll read just one. You've all been marching around for the climate all day, so I don't know. May, although, I don't know, maybe it'll be nice to sit in a chair for a while. Um, let me start with this one. Um, this is a scene that happens towards, towards the end of the book um, when uh, uh, our heroine, I'm um, sure, so oh, there it is. Um, our heroine uh, um, is now driving from Maine, where she lives, hmm. <laughs> back to Philadelphia, where her friends are, to attend the funeral of one of the six kids. Um, whose body has at last been found. Um, her friends don't know she's coming. They also don't know what happened to her because she vanished too. I wanted to yell at everyone. Oh, by the way, do you like these? These are my Walter Cronkite glasses. <laughs> don't I look smart with these? It's a little Walter Cronkite and a little, with the hair, a little Chewbacca, don't you think? <laughs> and in fact, when I wear these glasses with this hair, I'm a creature called bunk right <laughs> so I'm not just the way it is okay. some of the younger people are like Walter who <laughs> yeah it, raise your hand if you if you know who Chewbacca is but Walter Cronkite eh, no. yeah. All right. okay. and that's and that's the way it is I wanted to yell at everyone says she you're all so sure what the right thing to do would have been. What if there was no right thing? 
What if you've been born with a condition that, by its very nature, stuck you with an unsolvable philosophical puzzle from your earliest recollection of childhood to the present? Is it so impossible that you might imagine what it must have been like to have felt the things I've felt and not known what to do? Of course, there's a road map now. But when I was growing up, there wasn't any map. There was nothing. I was 50 years old before I ever saw anyone like myself on television or in a movie or in a book. In the absence of story, the very clear message was, people like you do not exist. The only transgender women I ever saw in the big mirror of the culture were murder victims in detective shows or sad sacks on talk shows being ridiculed or held up as circus freaks or drag queens with hilarious stage names. There weren't any moms or teachers or cops, people who just wanted to move on, to disappear into the anonymous, loving gray of a normal life. But I'm a relic. That's what I realize now. The world has become a safer place for transgender people, for some of us anyhow. Maybe it's become a safer place as a direct result of people coming out, being visible, living openly in the world. But I was never that brave. I set out to save the Shire, and the Shire has been saved. But not for me. I still remember going into Olin Library at Wesleyan when I was a student there, looking for books about the thing I was struggling with. What I found, of course, was nothing, or in some ways, worse than nothing. The only books I found were full of theories that were just hilariously, ridiculously wrong. There was one that said that people were trans because, quote, our fathers were too passive. Uh, there was another one that said we wanted to be closer to our mothers, uh, or that we were fetishists. There were lots of theories. I remember reading those books and thinking, gee, that doesn't sound right. Are they sure? It reminded me of a cartoon I once saw of a woman reading a book called All About You. The author? Not you. <laughs> I have a different theory, which is even more harebrained. It goes like this. Ready? Maybe we should all just love one another even if we don't completely understand the things that people bear in their dark, strange hearts, even if the things that, excuse me, even if the stars that other men and women are following seem invisible to us, if we make ourselves open to the humanity of others first, maybe understanding will follow. An incomprehensible theory of the universe isn't necessary if your only ambition is to em embrace another soul. What you need, maybe all you need, in fact, is the willingness to love. I crossed the Delaware River. To my right was the Iron Bridge with its sign, Trenton makes, the world takes. Yeah, well, I thought, sucks to be you, Trenton. <laughs> oh, thank you. More? More, more? You want to just go a little, another, another little tasty, tasty, tasty tidbit? Okay. All right. Uh, um, do you want it um, uh, shorter and amusing or kind of longer and more troubling? Uh, how, how tired are you? You want it? The long, long and troubling. Yeah, troubling. Yes, troubling. Let's hear it for troubling. All right, okay. We'll do that one. You'll be sorry. Okay. Uh, but where is that? Where is that? Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, let me just see how long this is, because I really don't want to keep you squirming. Um, Uh, oh, you know, it's, I can't, I'd, have to, I'd have to edit that one on the fly. So I'm going to go, we're going to, so short, short and sweet is back on the menu, boys. <laughs> okay. So, so here we are back in the, in the, um, back in the prison. And this is the, uh, um, this is the day on which everything headed south. Um, so they're in the prison, um, and one of their number of one of these six friends has disappeared. Um, and so... Uh, 
the um, uh, uh, two of them have been sent to go get help um, while the others keep searching. Um, and um, so these two characters are Rachel, who is a painter, um, uh, uh, or she wants to be a painter, uh, and her friend Quentin, who um, is uh, um, uh, he's a he's a young scholar. He's he's a scholar of German. He's 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 uh, he's trying to translate um, uh, American poetry into German editions. This is what he decided he's going to do after college, um, and uh, um, he's in fact translating Walt Whitman into um, into um, something called the. Um, uh, a Whitman anthology, which is called uh, Der Whitman Sammelband, <laughs> which his friends, unfortunately, l let him know actually translates as the Whitman Sampler. So, <laughs> um, so these two kind of almost went out at college. Anyway, they're on their way out. They're trying to get some help. When they arrived in the prison yard, they found that the skies had become dark with thick rain clouds. To their right was the blockhouse that led to the outside. Rachel noticed for the first time that there was a tall tower sitting atop it. It appeared to have been built more recently than the rest of the prison. I hear that train a-coming, said Quentin, imitating with uncanny precision the exact intonation of Johnny Cash singing Folsom Prison Blues. Oh, that's a good one, said Rachel. What, said Quentin, you're not a Johnny Cash fan? Not really, said Rachel. You know, I like it when he says, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. And then, like, all the convicts in the audience go, yeah! Rachel looked for a moment at beautiful, raggedy Quentin. His clothes seemed to have been purchased for a man 50 pounds heavier. I didn't know you had a Johnny Cash, she said. Oh, I got voices you don't even know about up here, he said, pointing to his brain. I got John F. Kennedy, I got Bob Dylan, I got June Lockhart, I got Tricky Dick Nixon. Rachel, still holding his hand, looked down at it for a moment as if it were some sort of odd seashell she'd picked up on a beach. Who's June Lockhart, she said. <laughs> uh, the mom on Lassie. Timmy, come back. Good girl, Lassie, good girl. She was on Lost in Space, too. Nixon, I am not a crook. Bob Dylan, geez, I can't find my knees. Kennedy, we choose to go to the moon and do the other thing, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Rachel shook her head, either in wonder or in sadness. Is, is that what you're going to be when you grow up? One of those guys who does impressions on TV? He looked hurt. I am grown up, he said. You think? She said. Hey, said Quentin. He was wearing wallabies and worn brown corduroy pants. This is what grown up looks like. You're so full of shit, she said. Quentin took his hand away from her. Don't be mad at me, Rachel, he said, just because you want me to be somebody else. I don't want you to be somebody else. I want you to be you. Her forehead crinkled into a scowl. Yeah, which is who exactly, said Quentin. That's what I don't know, she said. You imitate all these people, but you can't even imitate yourself. That doesn't actually mean anything, said Quentin. It's true, she said. Can we just get out of this place, please? said Quentin, looking at the high walls and the dark clouds. Maybe we could have this little psychodrama later on. <sighs> you mean never, she said. I would do anything to end this conversation, said Quentin, anything. Okay, answer me one question and I'll shut up, okay? One question. Fine. Why won't you sleep with me? Why won't I? We make out, you tell me you love me, you get my shirt off, and then just before we, you have to go. You're always leaving. Did you think I didn't notice that? Quentin's face colored. He looked down at the ground. Is it because I'm ugly, said Rachel. If I'm ugly, why don't you just tell me so? Quentin's lips twitched around as if he was trying to find some syllables that kept eluding him. Then he said in a voice that was almost a whisper, you're not ugly. Now Rachel started to cry. I don't understand you. Quentin put his hands on her shoulders. You're not ugly, Rachel. I think you're so beautiful. She turned her back on him. You, she said. He put his arms around her. I do think you're beautiful, he said, and I do love you. She turned around again. Then why are you so mean to me? Because, said Quentin. Because why? 
because, said Quentin again. He was whispering now, his voice like something echoing out of a cave. I'm afraid. Afraid, said Rachel. Afraid of what? And then the moaning voice they had heard before in the prison rose once more, hung in the air, and faded. Rachel and Quentin stared at each other for a second, then turned back toward the blockhouse and ran toward it, not looking back. Rachel pushed on the old iron door, but it would not open. Quentin pushed on it too, but he could see that since they had last passed through, someone had wrapped a heavy chain around the door and sealed it with a padlock. They were now locked in the old prison. I'm trapped, said Quentin. Thanks. Well, that's, 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 that's lovely. Thank you very much. So, um, what shall we do? Shall we have a little conversation? Why, I do think so. Um, I would be happy to talk about this book. I would talk about trans identity. Um, I would talk about the burden that peop the burden of secrets that people bear. I would talk about the difference between the people we become and the people that we were. I would talk about my son, Zach, who's sitting over there. Um, uh, I would talk about pretty much anyone except for Caitlyn Jenner at this point. <laughs> so, you know, we could talk about her too, but you'd have to buy a book. Mine, mine, I mean. Um, when I imitate Caitlyn, by the way, I always do her as Jimmy Stewart, which is meant, which I mean lovingly. Oh, I, I don't know, Johnny. I just think uh, I'd like a nice, juicy steak. <laughs> it's, it's uncanny, isn't it? Close your eyes. Is that Caitlyn Jenner <laughs> or is it Jimmy Stewart? It's incredible. A nice, juicy steak. I said to my wife, Chris, you know, Chris, when I won the Olympic medal, what I really wanted was a nice, juicy steak. All right. So, gosh, it's funny. A character who does lots of funny voices. Huh. I wonder what happens to Quentin. <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out. Hi. Hi. You're trying to get me to just stop. So no, I, I'm having a great time. Get me out of this. I, so I'm hi, what's your time. name? I'm Lauren. Hi, Lauren. What's hi. up? Hi. Um, is this am You're I on. at the yeah, right it's distance? Projecting. Okay. It's incredible. Um, so I think a lot about um, uh, events. Um, transitions that are a bright line in someone's life and I feel like that's reflected a lot in I read an interview with you in the Advocate or Out or somewhere mm -hmm. before I came here um, th that seemed to be like part of what you're talking about in this book and um, and and when you were introducing it a few minutes ago you were talking about how there can be multiples of those in someone's life and I, so I would just love to hear you talk more about that, and I'm also like trying to digest the idea that there could be multiples because for me, there's there are people who have had such significant things happen, either from inside or from outside, that their life is has a before and after. Right. And then there are people who I consider myself where a lot of intense things have happened, but there are enough of them that. I don't know that they're a bright line. So I'd love to hear yeah. you talk about that. Well, I mean, in some ways, we think of this as, as one of the definitions of trauma, right? Or, or PTSD, is that something happens and you can never quite get over it. But we tend to think of those things in terms of something bad happening. It's also true that I think some, I mean, sometimes people can be haunt. I mean, I'm a, as you probably know, I'm a great um, fan of haunted house narratives. Uh, there's, there's some version of a haunted house in virtually everything I've ever written, and in and, and this book as well. The prison is clearly a big, a big haunted house. Um, so to me, that's what it means to be haunted, is to have something that happened in the past that you now can't quite connect to. But it doesn't have to be something terrible. Sometimes, sometimes people be, can be haunted by something that was so great, you know, you know, that one Grateful Dead concert, you know, that the rest of your life is like, mm, Jerry's <laughs> dead now. Um, uh, so I think uh, there's this, this question of how do you, that, um, I mean, the world is full of, of, of exes and formers, right? I mean, ex-astronauts and um, 
former Marines and ex-nuns and um, ex-husbands, ex-wives. Um, and um, I just think it's, in, in some ways, it feels to me an injustice that we should be defined not by who we are, but by who we were. Um, and I think when, it, when we, you think about transgender people, I mean, um, that's, the, that's the thing that I think people um, are still trying to, it's one of the ways people try to cut us down to size. I mean, so I'm almost 60 years old, and so I've been female for 20 years. I was a young man for 20 years, and then I was a, a child and a teen, and I was and a, a youth for 20 years. So, um, you know, I've had I've had all these experiences, but um, uh, what makes me different from other women my age right now? I mean, if you and people wrestle with, in some ways, the definition of of male and female, not 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 to do too much of a deep dive into this, but I, I think it's interesting. So is it, chro is it really chromosomes? Like when you meet someone and you think, oh, that's a person who is the same gender that I, it's because, oh, because you did a little chromosome test. Really? I don't think so. Um, and of course, the world is full of, uh, among other people, um, uh, women with androgen insensitivity disorder who have a Y chromosome. They never know it. They have a Y chromosome, but they're, you know, no, no one ever, ever gives them a hard time. Um, is it about, okay, so if it's not chromosomes, is it um, uh, reproductive organs? I mean, you know, my, my Aunt Erna didn't have ovaries from when she was born, but no one gave her a hard time, except for my Uncle Jack, but that's a different story. Um, is it, I mean, so we can go through all of these, all these things that make people male or female. Um, my sense is, if there's any difference between me and other women my age right now. Um, it's history. It doesn't make me any less of a woman, um, but it does mean that my experience as a woman is, is, has been colored by the fact that I, ha that, that I have a different history. Um, so um, I think of my womanhood sort of like, um, oh, I don't know, like if you, were, if you were an immigrant. I mean, I got my green card as a woman, right? I speak with a little bit of a f funny accent, maybe, um, uh, and and I and and I have the memory of being that boy of m you know mowing mowing the lawn <laughs> in 1968. You know, uh, uh, so um, how do we how do we how do we connect these how do we connect these these all these different selves? Well, I think everybody has to. F find that peace for themselves. But I think that is, that is a, one of the things that, that makes people restless and ill at ease. If, if, you, if you, you look in the mirror and you think, how did I get here? Um, which is a question I think the older you get is one you ask more frequently. Um, but here's my answer. And it's just for me. For me, the answer is through story. It's through telling stories that we make sense of our lives. Because life is really chaotic. Life is a mess. Re I mean, how do we make sense of all this junk? You know, Donald Trump is president right now. I mean, what? Seriously? Did that happen? <laughs> all right, okay, all right, okay, all right. Sorry, sorry. Wrong I'm audience. Sorry. sorry, yeah, okay. So the way I make sense of the world and, and of my own experience is through telling story. and. Um, seeing my life as a single narrative, not as a bunch of little ones, but as one long loop. And I hope, I hope a story that will continue for, for a little bit longer. So I'm probably not answering a question at all. I'm just free associating in this entertaining way. But you know, I think <laughs> this is, I think this is the best I got for you. Thanks. So what else can I, what else can I tell you? And you, I mean, I know, I know you're supposed to go up to the microphone, but if you, if you want to shout it out, I can also repeat it. Um. Hi, you. What's 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 what's, what's our name? Frankie. Hi, Frankie. Oh, look at that! There's a lot going on there. <laughs> Woohoo! Wow! Wow! Okay. Hi. Hi. Um. Without giving too much away, uh, I have read the book, and uh, there is a teenage transgender character in the book. Um. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the the sort of motivation behind telling a story of someone who 
went through stealth yeah. and then having a teenager okay. right. in the present as well. So thank you. So so there's this older character, uh, who older, like my age, um, who is living in stealth, which means that nobody knows that she's trans. Like nobody. Including, hello, her husband. Um, because she's, I mean, and before you go, wait, well, how is that possible? I can tell you, I know, I was going to say a dozen, maybe fewer than a dozen, but more than half a dozen people who, and that's been their experience, that they, they went through transition and now they're living in the world and no one knows they're trans and they're, and they're married. And they, and they haven't told their husbands, which you can, you can, you can wonder about whether, about, about that choice. Um, but many people make that choice and I, I, I respect I respect any choice people make in order to find their sanity. Um, but um, as that monologue stated, that person is definitely a relic. That's not the experience that most trans people have now. There's also a very young character who came out as trans in middle school. Um, it's this character's son's best friend. Um, and so here's, here's this young person who's trans, who's out um, came out in their in their little main town as trans, rolled with it, and, every, and 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 everyone rolled with it, and it's fine. And to me, I really wanted to include that because um, the difference between what it means to be trans for someone my age or someone a little older than I am, and and someone who's coming out right now, it's 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 a very 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 different world. Um, and one of the things I wanted to show is that in in fact the biggest difference, and this was true for me. As well, uh, well, as well as this character, it was really not going from male to female. It's the difference between going from someone who has a secret to a person who doesn't have a secret. And so you have these two trans people, um, one in stealth and one so out it's boring and no one cares. Um, and that, that th I mean, increasingly that second dynamic is going to be the default in the culture, I hope. Um, but it won't always be the default. Um, I think that um, more and more and more of us are living, living openly in the world. But um, I think there will always be people who, who struggle and who are afraid. And, and, you know, if things have gotten better, um, not just for trans people, but for everybody who has a difference, they haven't gotten better for everybody. And race and class and privilege have a lot to do with it. And where you live in the country has a lot to do with it. Um, and for some, for some people, things have gotten worse. The increased visibility in the in the in the culture over the last half a dozen years, in some ways, means that now we're more visible, and the people who used to not do anything about us because they didn't know we were around now are all determined to come up with laws to keep us out of the bathroom. Um, because I mean, you know, a after decades and decades of trans women use using women's rooms without any problem whatsoever, suddenly now that now that we're visible. Mm -hmm. There have to be law. People are coming up with laws in which they're trying to legislate us out of existence in some ways. I mean, because this the issue in, in bathrooms is not about bathrooms at all. Of course, it's about the fact that some people don't like the fact that transgender people exist um, and can't imagine what our lives are like. So, in response to that, they're coming up with with um, ways of essentially preventing us from living our lives in the public space. Um, but you know. I'm giving a reading in North Carolina tomorrow. Ooh, and so, yeah, well, I, and I had to decide, well, is that a thing to do? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because um, I figured if we didn't sell a half a dozen copies of my novel, that economy would come crashing down. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, I, and so when I'm there, I suspect I will use the bathroom at some point. And part of me is like, OK, I'll go and use the ladies room and commit a felony. Or maybe I'll use maybe I'll use the men's room. You know, and just be like, okay, guys, happy? Yeah. Is this what you wanted? The wish is granted. I'm in the men's room with you. Yeah! But is it your experience <laughs> that, or your sense that the experience is very different for transgender women than transgender men? Because we hear a lot of violence, about a lot of violence against transgender women specifically. Um, and I'm just wondering, I don't know whether, you know, your teen character is a transgender boy. I, I wonder whether that was also conscious um, to, to, yeah, to delineate most, the most difference. Of the, most of the violence we're seeing is against transgender women of color. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, and, but it also, it, I mean, there's a lot, there are a lot of, there are a lot of determining factors. Um, 
that have to do with, um, with, with, you know, who who you're surrounded with and where you live, and um, so um, trans trans men are are more frequently off the radar. Mm -hmm. um, people who hate, I mean, in fact, the 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 law in Texas now, which is to keep keeping people out of the right restrooms is called the Protect Our Women Act or something like that. Does anyone know? It's like, it's, I think it's called the Protect Our, Protect Our Safety of Our Women Act. Um, so trans men are just like not on the radar. Um, you're reminding me of something I wanted to share, um, which is a thing that I learned. Um, uh, I, so another thing that happened to me in the last year, um, uh, about a year ago, right now, in fact, um, one day um, I lost um, most of my hearing. Um, the fire alarm went off in my apartment, and I was like turning off the, the you know the the alarm, and I had to keep hitting the button. And in order to do that, I had to like my ears were like right by the alarm. And when I finally got the thing off, I'd lost about 60% of the top end of my hearing. It's like one day. Now I think I was primed for that after a year of playing uh, after years of playing ro in rock and roll bands, but. Um, so now I have um, hearing aids, and I'm um, trying to learn how to read lips and um, um, learning ASL. Thanks very much. And y why, yes, it does suck. Thank you for asking. Um, but um, one of the things that amazes me about ASL is um, the, the, sh the sheer poetry of it. Um, and um, so I just want to show you a thing. So about 10 years ago, this was the, the sign for, um, for transgender people. So that's the letter X drawn across your cheek is sex. So you take sex and you flip it around. So sex backwards. That used to be the way people like me were um, symbolized. And not just in ASL, but kind of in the country. Uh, you know, but like someone who's been um, turned inside out, you know. You know that old song? Oh, once I knew, uh, once I sang a song about a man who got turned inside out. He had to jump into the river because it made him so very sleepy. You don't know that song? Okay. Sorry, I brought the whole thing up. Um, here's the new sign. What was that? Nice and slow. There's a flat. In fact, let's all do this. Ready? Make a little flower out of your, out of your fingers and put it over your left breast or chest or whatever you have here, right about here, right over your heart. Okay, it's gonna come out, as it comes out, you're, it's gonna face toward the ceiling, right, like this, go like this, and as it faces the ceiling, open the petals. Look at that, isn't that pretty? And now, put it back in your heart, petals are gonna close, and it's gonna go back in your heart, just like that, ready? Now we're gonna do it again, ready? Start like this, ready? Out, open, and in like this. Isn't that pretty? Okay. That's, that's the new thing. So, and forgive me for being the English teacher here, but there's a flower in your heart that cannot open because it's stuck inside. It cannot see the sunlight. So you bring that out into the sunlight. Look, and now it's facing the right way, and the petals can open, and now it can go back in your heart in the right direction. And to me, that's the difference between 10 years ago and now. 10 years ago, we were actually now it's this. And this, to me, is about more than being trans. It's about, um, well, geez, both this novel and this room is filled with people who have either now or have had something in the past that was stuck inside your heart that you could not bring out into the open. And as long as it's stuck in there, it cannot flower. And as long as that can't happen, you can't be you. Um, and that's true whether you're trans or whether you want to be an artist or um, whether you are a celebrity chef or whether you're just a person who has a secret that you're afraid to tell other people about. Um, but you bring it out into the open and the petals open and now it can go back into your heart. And that's, to me, that's the journey that we are trying to take both as a culture and also in our lives. It's that. So anyway, <sighs> sorry. Were we talking about the novel a little while ago? <laughs> um, another question? Or so, how am I doing on time? Well, I had a question. Make, you want? Oh, hi, yeah. Yes, hi. Where are you? Oh, right hi, here? hello. Yes, hi. hello. 
What's up? Yes, I had a question about um, the word trans or the or the identification of trans, in the sense that um, trans suggests movement, or uh, rather than actual. Um, well, you were talking about a before and an after, and that you were a boy and and now you're a woman who hasn't had a, a girl girlhood. And I'm just interested to know about um, what your thoughts are on the idea of um, always identifying as trans rather than, I mean, you have to identify as trans in order to, at this stage, you know, f make people understand about transgender issues rather than just being a woman. And at what point are you able to just say, I've arrived, I am a woman, and I don't have to keep identifying as trans. I can just be a woman. That's yeah, what my that's question Yeah, that's a good question. Is. I mean, in some pe for some people, uh, um, some people never do that. Some people kind of like being in a kind of um, uh, out, open, um, trans space. For me, um, you know, I don't really identify as trans except when I step up to microphones. Um, in my daily life as a, um, a parent and a spouse and as a teacher, um, you know, I, I generally do those things as a woman. Um, and uh, I don't... I don't occupy, I don't, well, you tell me. I was, I was gonna say, I don't occupy a radical space in, you know, moment to moment. It's not like I go into a 7-Eleven and get a, you know, a slushie as like, I'm trans while I'm drinking this slushie. <laughs> I'm destabilizing this 7-Eleven. <laughs> you know, is this, this is a regressive, a regressive slushy that I am sipping here. How do you feel? You know, most of the time it's kind of like, well, yeah, I'll have a slushy, <laughs> and maybe some of those bako bits. <laughs> um, but sometimes I think that, um, I mean, I guess it, it depends what we mean by what does it mean? What does it mean to be? Um, what does it mean to change the culture? What does it mean? How do? What, what does it mean to occupy a radical space? I mean. My wife and I have raised two sons in a conservative little town in rural Maine um, who are awesome young men. As a trans woman and a straight woman, happily married, thanks for asking, for almost 30 years now. Um, and I think that's pretty radical. Um, so, um, when do you arrive? I don't know. When did you become a woman? Well, I, I never arrived with anything but female in, in my head. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not when you were two, when you were two, well, before you had language, let's say, when you were one, if I said, are you, a f w are you female? You would have gone, <laughs> 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 Let me say that it has never been an issue for me, so I've never had to confront it. Well, but you, you were the, the kind of, female you were when you were five as a different female that you a different kind of female than when you were 20. So um, if you're talking about like an, an actual phys if all we're talking about is a physical body there was one day when I had one kind of physical body and then there was another another day another day when I had another kind of physical body and I had amazing painkillers woohoo um, so but I don't think that's the day you become a woman I, um, is you know is I mean for for someone else, is it the day you get your period? Is that the day you become a woman? Well, that, I mean, life is, is, is we were talking about this, w this is where we began. What's the moment of before and after? When do we become ourselves? Um, so, in some ways, I became a woman rather than a, a transgender person in transition the day I, s I kind of stopped talking about it, which unfortunately hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, the, the, the day in which I, I stopped thinking of my, myself as being all that interesting. Um, um, <laughs> you're making me think. So I went to my, I went to my 40th college reunion um, two years ago. Uh, and um, I was sitting in with, with a band, a band from the, the early 70s that used to play. Um, and it was, you know, and they had me sit in on, I, I play the, the keyboards, so they had me sit in on a couple things, and so I went to the rehearsal before the, before the show, and they said, okay, we're gonna do, um, 
a lot of, you know, there were half a dozen songs that we rehearsed. But the first one, we're going to open up with this great group, this great Eric Clapton thing. Actually, it's a Spencer Davis group. Uh, I'm a man, yes I am, yes I am, and I'd love to love you, baby. And I said, seriously? They said, yeah, you know that song, I'm a man? It's an incredible song. It'll be great. great. Everybody will come dance. I said, wait, you want me to step onto the stage and play I'm a man? And they said, yeah, it's a great dance song. And it's like, we used to play, I said, you want me to play I'm a man. And he's like, yeah, oh, yeah. And then he just said, Boylan, we're your oldest friends. Everyone stopped thinking about that years ago. So the day they stopped thinking about it, that's the day I stopped thinking about it. Is that good? Or one more? One more good one? One more short one? Oh, I don't have a short one. <laughs> okay, ask me a long one. Um, I actually wanted to ask uh, about the um, – I love the book and tore through it and ended up, which is not something I always do, reading the acknowledgments page. And I was oh, curious about the – You read the acknowledgments page in the ARC, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah, the, which I cut because I thought it was too pretentious. Oh, so, well, I enjoyed it. So, <laughs> so ask, ask me – Not, I'll but I'm very it, pretentious. I'll tell you whether it made it or not. Um I was uh I was very curious about the Amtrak Writers in Residence program, <laughs> and like what it was like, you know, whether because I I take the tra I live in Baltimore and I commute yeah. here for work and I write on the train all the time and I love it. I feel like I get my best work done there. And I was just curious about traveling across the country, writing on a train, and whether yeah. what helps, you know, the good things about it, the bad things, stuff of like the, that. Of the many weird adventures, and believe me, there have been a lot of weird adventures. Um, being in the first group of Amtrak writers in residence was one of the weirdest and most fun because who doesn't want to ride on a train? And who doesn't want to write on a train? So the Amtrak writers in residence program was, I, I think, a stroke of genius. Um, so they don't sell out every seat on every single train. And so what they do, what they did was, they took, you know, there are these sleeper trains that go across the country. And whenever there's an unsold berth, they pick like 12 writers. And there was like one each month. I think I was in no November, 80, uh, uh, six, uh, no November 16, maybe November 15. Anyway, 15. Um, so uh, it actually cost them almost nothing because no one was sleeping in that berth anyway. So they put a writer in it, and I, and I wrote and you know blogged about it and tweeted about it. And it drew a lot of attention, I think, to the delights of cross-country train travel, um, which everyone should do. Um, it's not going to be cheaper than taking the plane. It costs more money to go that slowly, and it's worth it. So I went by the Down Easter from Maine to um, Boston. I took the uh, Lakeshore Limited from Boston to Chicago, the California, California Zephyr, or as we say in Maine, Zephyr, to... Um, Salinas, California, where I got off the train and, and finished, the, finished this novel. The la I wrote the last half chapter in, 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 um, in Big Sur. Then I jumped back on the train and I took the Coast Starlight to Seattle, taught a couple classes at a college in Seattle, jumped on the Empire Builder through um, the Dakotas, back to Chicago, and then back to Maine. And it took about three maybe three and a half weeks. Um, and, you know, it, I, it was absolutely fabulous. The food is really good. That's the thing you don't, you don't think. The food is fabulous. You can get a shower on the train. Uh, and um, I, I thought it was just delightful. Um, um, trains are great places for writing. And you know the very, 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 very best part? There's like, oh, like... 900 miles where there's no internet. Oh, thank you, God. <laughs> and even if I wanted to, I couldn't, I couldn't make any calls. I couldn't check my, my, my notices. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't check my wall. I couldn't, I couldn't post. I couldn't tweet. I read a book. Like an actual book. An actual freaking book. Which is a thing that you should all do. I know a good place to buy a book and not just mine. It's politics and prose, and I'm so grateful to um, to you and to everyone here at this legendary store. There are maybe a half a dozen stores in the country that I think of um, as more than bookstores. Um, 
you know, there's the tattered cover in Denver. There's um, Powell's in in uh, in Portland. There's uh, Elliott Bay in Seattle, um, and uh, yeah, there's. I mean, there's there's, but to me, the difference between those bookstore between a, a regular bookstore and a bookstore like this is the difference between going to church and going to a cathedral, and um, so. Hi, you're by the microphone. I was, I, I was, I, I was about to wrap it up. You want to ask a question? I do want to ask. I'm going to wrap it up with this question. Okay. So, thank you very much. First of all, I want to introduce myself by saying I am also a trans woman, and I want to talk about piggybacking on, on identity is that we talked about a few minutes ago. You talked about a few minutes ago, um, and stealth. So. I find it interesting that like when I was 25 years old, I certainly had the fantasy that I would, you know, the only way I could possibly transition was to disappear and everyone that I, who I knew in my life growing up, I, I would just have to cut off all contact because that's just, that just seemed like the only way to do it. Right. Well, here I am now as a 51 year old woman. I transitioned successfully mid-career as later in life as a middle-aged person. And while I don't walk down the street with a sign saying, trans woman, I don't feel the need to be stealthy about it either. I feel like I can talk about it and be open about it. And I'm curious as to, you know, you've been out there for a long time. How did that come about for you where you decided, you know, I'm going to be really public about this. I mean, you published, you, you really put yourself out there as a pioneer for women like myself. So thank you for that. And curious as to how your th thought process or what your history was there. Huh. Well, thank you. Um, I, let me think. Um, er, you know, er, there's, been, there's been so many different m moments um, since I came out. I mean, originally I really did want no one to know. Um, because there was some, I don't know, I guess I felt like, um, I felt like my womanhood could be taken away from me mm -hmm. because it was so fragile. Um, it was like, you know, my gender, what, what do they say about the immunity necklace on Survivor? It was always back up for grabs. <laughs> oh, there are <laughs> one or two Survivor <laughs> watchers <laughs> among, among the people of a certain age. Um, uh. So I didn't want to be seen as trans. In some, in some ways, I was, I was afraid that I was going to be in danger or that my family was going to be in danger. I mean, I changed everybody's names in um, She's Not There because I thought that people would, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I really feared that my family was going to be on the receiving end of violence or something. Um, but on the other hand, if I really wanted my privacy, maybe I should have not written a book and maybe I should have not gone on Oprah, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, I remember like the day after the first time I was on the Oprah show, like walking through a little town in Maine and someone like, you know, rolling down the window, you know, as they drove past. Hey, congratulations on the sex change. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I think it comes back to this business of is being trance, um, whatever that might mean. Uh, 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 something that you should be. First, first I thought it was something I should be ashamed of, and then I got over that. Then I thought it was something I should be proud of, and then I might have gotten over that. I mean, not that I'm not uh, not proud, but um, it's it's just kind of a thing at this point um, that I was lucky enough to to get through, and it was a very very difficult thing to get through, and I would not have made it if it was not for for my wife Didi, um, and also. Um, my sons um, and some of our other kind of friends. So, you know, considering that, that I wasn't sure I was going to survive this, it's now something that I'm rather cavalier about. And I look back on like, well, that seems, because it was a long, it was a long time ago. The last thing I'll say, I'll just, I'll just put it this way. Um, obviously, um, I had an experience very much like the experience that this, the character had in that first piece that I read of going into the library in at my college in the 70s and there 
were all of these like horrible books that like psychologists and psychiatrists they just made up shit Be and no one stopped them no one called them on it because because there were no trans people in the public eye to say actually everything you're saying is bullshit because so they could just say anything and publish their you know and they get their their doctorates based on on crap that they just made up about people like us um so um okay so there are lots of times now where i wish i still had my privacy i mean it's nice to be recognized i'm recognized a lot especially since that <laughs> silly caitlin jenner show i was on um uh but um there th it is weird to have people know something tremendously personal about you and there are some times where i kind of wish that i you know that i wasn't out so publicly. On the other hand, I think now somebody who's, you know, the age I was when I went to the library can now find a book by me. They can find a book by Susan Stryker. They can, you know, they can find a book uh, by Janet Mock, you know, or Chas Bono or Jameson Green. Um, they c there, are, there are lots and lots of good books written not only about us now, but by us now. So it's no longer all about you by not you. Now it's all about you by us. Um, a great book I'll plug if you have to buy a book other than mine, and I don't know if you have it in the store, um, uh, uh, um, Trans Bodies, Trans Selves. By, uh, it's, a, it's a big, thick thing from uh, the Oxford University Press. If you don't know it, you can, you can find it somewhere. Um, but that's a great first book, and it's, full, it's a compendium. It's like that thick, and every possible trans voice including many that contradict and disagree with each other, we're all in that book. Um, and that's the thing. It's, it's, a, it's a very diverse community now. It's, there are many, many ways of being trans. Um, it used to be that if you saw a transgender person on TV, it was going to be, you know, a, a nice, white, middle-aged, upper-class lady like me. You know, M to F, transsexual, so-called. Um, now, you see trans men you see genderqueer people, you see drag queens, you see people of color, you see many, there are many, many ways of being us, leading, so to the old cliche now, if you've met one transgender person, you've met one transgender person. <laughs> and the diversity of our community is in fact its strength. So yeah, sometimes I wish I had my privacy, but because of the fact that people are living their lives openly now, um, the next generation is going to be, be 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 better. There's a Paul Simon song. I believe in the future we will suffer no more, not in my lifetime, but in yours. I feel sure. Thank you. Thank you.